So we need to determine the power in fat if we have got less than the majority of the voting right. Let's consider the size and dispersions of the voting right. For example, in this case 1, A have got 48% of B. Because we have got less than 50, basically this is not 50% or more for sure. Therefore, we cannot say that we have got the power. So therefore, we will consider all other facts and circumstances. Say for example, if we consider the size and dispersions of the other shareholders. In this case, we have been told that the other 52%, those shareholders are widely dispersed. Basically, each of them have got 1% or even less. No single other investors can exercise power. Therefore, if we can demonstrate, basically all these other 52% shareholders, they never will go for the AGM, they never will vote, or only a minority of them will vote, then even though I got only 48%, always I win. If this is the case, the 48% investment in B can dominate the decision making of B. And if this is the case, A actually have got the power over B. 48 and the other are all widely dispersed. Basically, you may be trying to argue that you have got the power. How about another situation in scenario 2? C has got 45% of D. 45%, not 50% or more. Therefore, we cannot say that we have got the power. So we consider also other facts and circumstances. For this case, for the other 55%, basically there are two substantial shareholders. Each of these two shareholders have got 26%. Even though all the other 3% are widely dispersed, because of these two substantial shareholders, they can come together. If they come together, they will win against C. Therefore, C cannot say that they have got the power over D because the other two significant shareholders can cooperate. And therefore, you cannot always win. In order to say that you have got the power, always you can win. Therefore, in this situation, basically we cannot say that C have got the power over D. Another scenario, scenario 3. G have got 45% over H. 45%, not more than 50. Therefore, we cannot say that we have got the power. Then we consider other circumstances, like the size and dispersions of the other shareholders. In this case, we have got 11 shareholders. Each of them have got 5%. So basically, 5% is quite substantial especially if this is a big company. If I've got 5% of Hong Kong band, surely I will attend the AGM of Hong Kong band. And therefore, these shareholders, many of them may be involved in the decision making. And if this is the case, G cannot say that G can have got the power because they cannot always win. G cannot always win. Therefore, no power. So I said 5% may be quite substantial. How about 4%, 3%, 2%, 1%? It depends, right? Therefore, there may be some gray area where we can exercise our professional judgment to decide whether we have got power. Another scenario, scenario 4. L have got 38% over M. 38% is not more than 50, so we cannot say that we have got the power. So therefore, we consider all other facts and circumstances. In this case, we find that there are three quite substantial shareholders. Each of these three shareholders have got 4%. 4% is quite substantial, so we expect that they may attend the AGM and involved in the decision making. But all the other 50% of the shareholders, they are widely dispersed. They have got less than 1%, for example. And many of them actually never attend the AGM. So from the past experience, I want only half of them will attend the AGM. This past experience, this record may be important because we may try to argue that we have got the power 
based on all based on all the facts and circumstances. Therefore, we consider if half of this fifty percent shareholders never attend AGM, therefore actually the maximum only seventy five percent of the shareholders may attend the AGM. If only seventy five percent of the shareholders attend AGM, thirty a over seventy five is more than half. So basically, in reality, in fact, in substance, L may be dominate in the AGM and all general meeting. If we can dominate in the general meeting, we always win. Therefore, with all these facts and circumstances, we may try to argue that L actually have got the power in fact. Of course, we have to consider many other circumstances, but basically, this can be one evidence to demonstrate that we may have the power over entity M. So we may, we may consider size and dispersions. Another items that we may consider is the potential voting rights. Potential voting rights. So basically, what is potential voting rights? Potential voting rights are rights from convertible instruments, for example, convertible preference shares, convertible bonds, or options, or forward contracts, in which we have got the right to obtain voting rights. So you can convert your convertible bonds so that you will become an ordinary shareholders. So we have got a potential voting right. This kinds of potential voting rights will be considered only if this is substantive. What is substantive? Substantive means you have got the practical ability to exercise the option. Take an example. In the year 2001, a holds 40% of B, uh, 40 of S, and B holds 60% of S. So A have got 40%, B have got 60%. So certainly A cannot say that we have got the power. So in, if this is the case, usually we will say that B, because B have got 60%, B has got the power. Something happens on 1st of January 2005. S issue option to A so that A can buy all 50 million new shares issued by S. But remember, this is just an option. Before we exercise the option, this is just our potential voting right. We will consider this potential voting right. We will consider this option if this is substantive. That means we have got the practical ability to exercise. First of all, if this is a substantive option, we got practical ability to exercise only if it is exercisable in 2005, right? So this option is exercisable in 2005. So basically, you may have the practical ability. So we may consider other first and circumstances to see whether this is substantive. But anyway, we have to consider this potential voting right if it is substantive. So if we consider this potential voting right, what is the result? Before we exercise this option, we got 40%. So A have got 40%. If we exercise this option, we will have 50 million more. Therefore, you will have 90 out of 150. So 90 out of 150 is more than half. Therefore, we have got the power. Of course, if we have already exercised the option, A have got the power. But as I've said before, this is a potential voting right. We will consider this potential voting right even before we exercise if this is substantive. So we consider other facts and circumstances. Say, for example, if the exercise price of the option is deeply out of the money, out of the money means if this is a call option, if the exercise price is higher than the market price. Say for example, now Hong Kong bank is around $55. If the exercise price is 65, I don't have the incentive to exercise the option because I can buy from the market only 55. Why I bother to exercise the option at 65? If this is the case, 
this is not substantive. Even though it is currently exercisable, but it is deeply out of the money, you will not have the practical ability, you will not have the incentive to exercise. The other way around, if the exercise price is deeply in the money, in the money means the exercise price is lower than the market price. Say for example, Hong Kong Bank now is 55, you can exercise at 45, so of course you got the incentive, you got the practical ability to exercise the option, and therefore we may consider this potential voting right. So once we consider this potential voting right, we say that A actually have got the power. We consider this potential voting right now, naturally many many years, years before, we don't consider this kind of option, and therefore there was a very famous case, we call it M1's case. M1's case. M1 was a very huge power trading company in North America. So basically, M1 used this kind of potential voting right. So they have got many projects, they set up many projects, and then M1 said, I don't invest in the ordinary shares of that company, therefore they are not my subsidiary. So I got only 5%, 10%. Ordinary shares, but in addition to these ordinary shares, they have got many options, convertibles. So, if we consider only the actual shareholdings and we don't consider the potential voting rights, of course, those projects are not the subsidiaries of M1. But once the project is successful, M1 exercises the option that becomes subsidiary. If that project is not successful, they never exercise the option. Therefore, M1 cherry pick. They select only the project that they want to consolidate and they convert their potential voting rights. By doing so, M1 can prepare a very good consolidated financial statements because only if the project is successful, they exercise the option and control and become the subsidiary. If that project is not successful, they don't exercise the option and they forget about it. But of course, even though they do not exercise the option, that was their investment. That was their project. In substance, in reality, they should not be allowed to do so because all projects are actually their project. Therefore, after the collapse of this M1, we consider also the potential voting rights.